Please report to the Kiana system. Our partnership with the Krenum is starting to bear fruit, but the project may take more time to complete than we have left. We must consider any plan that ensures our survival. So, last part, we discovered a hidden Krenim colony in the Krayana system that had escaped eradication by the Vardwa by creating a time-phasing bubble that hid their entire planet and its lunar colonies. Stumbling upon them, the Alliance, aware of the Iconians' weakness for time travel, eagerly reached out to accept the Krenim's offer of a joint partnership in the development of a time weapon. Not everyone in the Alliance is as eager as Captain Kagran here to see the use of temporal weapons in this war, considering the frequent collateral damage that can occur when messing with history. But the project went ahead anyway, just in case. We still might not use it. You are cleared for docking. That is a lot of ships. We beam aboard this Krenim station. At least with the size of this fleet in the area, we won't have to worry about being attacked. This station has been under construction over the past few days, weeks, at a record pace alongside the construction of the time ship based on the design theories by a Krenim scientist called Anorax. He never completed his design in this timeline, but the Krenim still had them, and the Alliance has been pouring mines and resources into its rapid production. The vessel's frame is almost complete already, but getting the weapon to work is another whole issue. This facility is being overseen by several management staff. Seven of Nine is overseeing the design issues of the vessel, Krenim Noye is responsible for plotting temporal target scenarios, and Nog oversees the project and reports to the Alliance. Clearly, something else is going on. Diverting this many vessels to the Kriana system signals an imminent offensive on our part, and we've been in the dark over the last few days out on patrol in the Delta Quadrant. Fortunately, Lieutenant Tulek, one of Kagran's men, is here to meet us at our beam-in point. Greetings! On behalf of Captain Kagran and Alliance Command, I am pleased to welcome you to our research station. The Captain is completing his preparations. In the meantime, I will give you a tour of the facility where we are building a weapon that will end the Iconian threat once and for all. Follow me. Our researchers can explain how the weapon works and answer any questions you may have. And here, we have the development area. How much do you know about the Krenum, Seven of Nine? The Borg have extensive records on the Krenum. They were a species of great interest to the Collective. I'm not sure I like the idea of the Borg studying us like a bug in a petri dish. I'm not sure I like the idea of the Borg studying anyone. And what about the Iconians? The Collective spent a great deal of resources pursuing Iconian technology. They believed the species to be extinct. They were incorrect. So much for the Borg knowing everything. The Iconians' technology is far beyond even the capabilities of the Borg. Fine. But what about shielding the ship that's using the weapon? We haven't solved the paradox problem yet. This is not my first experience with alternate timelines. It would be possible to develop a form of temporal shielding to protect this vessel from alterations in the timeline. In the Tales of War short stories, we can see that Noye and Seven don't exactly get along. After saying our hellos, we introduce ourselves to researcher Jelen, who offers us a brief explanation as to how this temporal ship is supposed to work. Welcome to our facility. I'm working with one of the teams here to develop the time ship and choose a target. What we do is different from time travel. Anorex's designs are actually for a weapon that can remove elements from the time stream completely, and then time reshapes itself to account for that absence. Ah, a great time yeet. But, time travel or no, this would completely alter the present. Either reshaping the present, or splintering off completely and making a completely new timeline. In some ways, yes. Once the weapon is fired, it can create an entirely new reality. And anyone or anything that isn't temporarily shielded will be a part of that reality. That's why we have to proceed slowly. If we're not careful, we could change everything we know, and not even know what's happened. Changing the universe in such a way sounds like it could be just as dangerous for us as it would be the Iconians. But think of the possibilities. We could reverse the effects of wars, stop threats like the Iconians, even turn back time and eliminate the Borg. This is a weapon, but it's one that can make a better galaxy. 
Weapons have a purpose, and that is not to make things better. Honestly, it's attitudes like Jillen's that make me think this whole thing is a bad idea, and it's the same sort of thinking that led to Anorax's fall during the Year of Hell. Captain Cogren's briefing is about to begin. Follow me to the conference room. <sighs> Where's Agent Daniels when you need him? The station has been designed with visitors in mind, so it's quite easy to navigate, following the red line to the conference room. In pride of place is the Krenim Imperium sigil. They are blissfully unaware that they've constructed this time ship before, years ago, and a resulting knot in time they made was so messy that it had to be cut out entirely with the destruction of the time ship itself. Unfortunately, those lessons too were lost. At least to these people. The time agencies of the far future are aware of the Year of Hell at least, but they left that alone to resolve itself, so perhaps them not being here is a sign that we are not mucking things up too much? Yet? From the observation window beyond the grand construction ring of the station we can see the Alliance fleet unified by the many glow of nacelles ticking over. Federation Blue, Klingon Crimson and Romulan Green powerful display of unity against this Iconian resurgence. Dotted about the numerous display cases of the meeting room are relics of other time travel related experiments. I am not sure what capacitor, uh, capacity this serves, but my tricorders read it as being in a state of temporal flux. I'm not sure what that doohickey is, that one just looks phallic, and is that a cage next to it? When we're done browsing, let's look at the attendees. Admiral Quinn himself is present, alongside Admiral Kararek of the Republic and Captain Cargron. Furthermore, we have Captains Drock and Chon, the commanders of their respective factions' flagships, and Ensign Philip Cray of the Department of Temporal Investigations. This officer, much like Hale here, has a interesting history involving time displacement. Greetings. I have heard much about your victories against the Iconians. It is an honor to work with a warrior like yourself. We are almost ready to begin. First, however, Agent Cray would like a word. Greetings. My name is Philip Cray. I'm the liaison from Temporal Investigations for this project. I have met you before, once or twice, outside Quinn's office at Earth Space Dock. Who are you, exactly? Well, where do I start? I'm 157 years old. That's only because I spent 90 years caught in a temporal distortion in the Typhon Expanse, serving as an ensign under Captain Morgan Bateson on the USS Bozeman. Much of the crew of the Bozeman found it difficult to integrate back into Starfleet. So much had changed. The Temporal Intelligence Agency took in many of my shipmates, due to our first-hand knowledge of events that occurred in the past. So, that's where I ended up. Uh, now you've been sent here to keep an eye on this project? Well, we all feel a little better knowing the DTI is actually paying attention. The Federation has some serious concerns about possible violations of the Temporal Prime Directive. Normally, Starfleet personnel are strictly prohibited from directly interfering with historical events and should make every effort to maintain the timeline. Right, first-hand experience on that one, yet now we're the ones building a weapon to... meddle. Indeed. That should tell you how serious this war has become. If the Iconians win, there probably won't be anyone left to preserve the timeline. In this instance, my role is to ensure that we succeed in our task with the minimal possible disruption to the timeline, as well as to address any repercussions of those disruptions. It 
kind of seems like we're treating this big directive as only being a directive when it's convenient. I don't disagree. As a Starfleet officer, I am sworn to uphold the Temporal Prime Directive. Not only that, but I have seen firsthand the dangers that come from ignoring it. But as the Vulcans say, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The Iconians cannot use time travel, and that makes it a weapon we can use against them. We must consider carefully whether it is too dangerous of a weapon to use at all. It's up to you how you feel about this situation and can answer in kind. It will have no effect on proceedings and we don't hear the reply. But for Hale, well, he feels that time should not be messed with to such a huge extent and worries for the precedent it sets at such a scale, although in this instance he does understand. This sort of tech, however, is enough to start a temporal cold war. The war is not going as well as we might wish. Our fleet are protecting key worlds, but dozens of other targets have fallen to herald attacks. Civilian casualties are rising. We need to act. This facility is building a device to turn the tide in our favor. Captain Nog, what is the status of the weapon? We've had some setbacks, Captain. We're still weeks from a working prototype. No amount of temporal manipulation will change that. And have you chosen a target for the temporal incursion? We are still running simulations. We've configured the holodecks to help us evaluate the possible changes that occur after removing an element from the time stream. Some of these scenarios show promise, but none are exactly what you want. Very well. We cannot afford to wait another day. We are losing this war. We need to strike now. A direct engagement is our only option. We will put all our resources into a full attack on the Iconians. Every ship we can muster will be a part of one massive strike against the Herald Sphere. Captain Paris is already moving into position with the Vanguard. Ships here will report to the Herald Sphere as soon as possible. There will be more warriors in Stovokor tonight. But first, we will make the Iconians bleed. So that's the mission. An unprecedented assault on the Iconian sphere. Conventional attacks have failed in the past, and we've been mostly on the defensive, so a strike like this might work. The sheer scale being something the Iconians are unprepared for? But I have doubts. We still risk being deflected, and then we've wasted more resources, but the timeship is still weeks away, and these smaller skirmishes are losing us ground, worlds, ships and lives. Maybe, while we still have the forces, we hit harder than ever before. There certainly is a lot of ships here. I actually gave up counting when I got to 200, but I estimate there's genuinely almost a thousand vessels here, including the Vanguard sent on ahead. With such an operation, we're divided up into strike wings, and our position is part of the group that will reinforce the Vanguard. You know, I've never seen this many ships in one place before. This has to be enough. Among our local team is the USS Decker, named after the famed Starfleet Commodore and later Captain, the USS McKinley, named after a president, similarly to the Starfleet Space Station, the USS Kennedy, another president, the USS Nelson, the latest in a long line of ships to bear that name, and the USS von Richthofen, named after the German ace pilot, the Red Baron of World War I. On the Klingon contribution, we have the IKS Reclaw, named after a second dynasty emperor, and in a very Klingon fashion, the IKS Katrellan, the warrior who slew Reclaw. The IKS Rurik is named after Rurik the Dam, who conquered the Zora Fell, and the IKS Shenara is named for Reclaw's daughter. The Romulan Republic forces are fewer, as a smaller power they generally are, but there is the RRW Hiran and the Kretak. Hiran was a Praetor who was assassinated by Shinzon in 2379, and Kretak is a Dominion wartime leader and senator. Alpha Wing, you are cleared for departure.
It seems the Vanguard has already engaged the enemy and the fleet immediately has spread over the orbit of the Dyson Sphere to draw apart the Iconian forces. This has allowed our Alpha Wing to warp past the lines of the Herald vessels to rendezvous with the Vanguard. Captain Tom Paris, still alive and kicking, contacts us as we arrive. Am I glad to see you. This... it's just not working. The Iconians are gating in their ships, and they have far more reserves than we anticipated. I've called for a hold on the flagship assault until we regroup. There's no point in a suicide run. First, we need to help our ships in trouble. Can I count on you to help? Well, it's getting late, and I thought I might just head back, to be honest. Seriously though, we can aid those damaged vessels. Our first priority is to draw Herald ships away from the crippled ones so that we can get them flying again and regroup for our main objective, which is to get inside that sphere. This is Kyla Mex from the USS Keller. We are losing warp containment and are in need of immediate assistance. Yeah, engines and weapons are down. Requesting immediate assistance. Our team forms up behind us and we engage the nearby Herald vessels in our path. Several Kuas cruisers and many smaller Bolton raiders. Wind This is Commander Dovalon. RRW. Require me. The familiar whine of Iconian anti-proton weapons sounds as they fire back and we join this huge battle in orbit of the Iconian's foothold in our galaxy. Our next target, aside from shooting down some probes, is the larger Vomp battleship. As we have seen many times before, it opens up a gateway to a sun, directing the burning star against our ship. If we prioritise these gates as they appear though, we can shut them down before we take too much damage. We've taken out the enemy vessels in our path, however, those other ships that sent out their distress calls are still closer to that sphere. The mega structure is so large that we cannot even tell if we're approaching it. However, more Herald forces remain in our way. take out the ships as we can, but our priority is to stabilise our allies. We seize the opening and race over to support our friends, restoring their containment and preventing a fatal warp core breach. As we aid our last ally, a new phase of this operation begins. Damaged Dreadnought has retreated using a gateway into the sphere. That's our way in. We are clear to enter the gateway. Well, we're in, and the remnants of the Vanguard and Alpha Wing should be following us if they can make it. We appear to be inside some chamber filled with hovering platforms, and this large dreadnought is tethered to a gateway being produced by one of them. Maybe this is the Iconian equivalent of a repair bay? Architecture similar to the Solonay sphere spreads out below us, but there are design elements of something else. Probably Iconian. The flagship's shields are down, and it's losing power. 
Looks like they're trying to interface with the sphere to give themselves a boost. This might be our one chance to board it and take control. I have three troop transports standing by. Well then, let's clear the skies for them. Our objectives seem to be making themselves apparent. If we can take over that dreadnought, we'd have a way to interface with the sphere's functions, and Intel suggests that it's from here that the Iconium Gateway Network is run. Inside are some more Herald ships, but the IKS Quartar's suicide run has let the USS Mercury and the remaining Delta fight vessels penetrate the sphere. Gates have opened up and deployed Herald vessels to defend their crippled dreadnought. Before we can board that vessel though, we're going to need to take them out to protect the carriers. There's probably a reason we can't just beam over. After a drawn-out conflict and several more gates worth of Iconian ships, we have managed to occupy the enemy long enough for the boarding parties to make it across. They have seemingly also secured a transporter site beachhead, and now we can beam over teams in greater numbers, but I'm afraid that we'll have to wait until the next part of this story series, as this is a very long mission and I'm still trying to catch up with the workload incurred by real-life problems. Suffice to say, things aren't looking too bad for the Alliance right now. There has been a major cost in lives already, but we're making progress in this offensive. We might actually be able to do this without resorting to temporal cheating. So thank you for watching this first part in the Iconian Offensive, and I hope to see you next time for the continuation of this war. Thanks again, and sorry for the unexpected two-parter, but until the next video, I've been Rick. Thanks again, and goodbye.